Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Good Old Podcast. I'm Jack Frenchley for Wahoo's 24-7. And we have a lot of big news to discuss this week. Obviously, the big news on Monday morning was that wide receiver coach Marcus Higgins has departed Virginia and is now the wide receiver coach and the offensive recruiting coordinator for Penn State. If you're a Virginia fan or even just a casual fan, you know the name Marcus Higgins. He's a a guy that has been really close to Virginia, the Virginia community. His wife and his kids have been a big part of the University of Virginia program. He's been through three different head coaches. He was a player. He was a grad assistant. But for the first time in over a decade, he will not be on the sidelines at Scott Stadium. So we brought in our recruiting extraordinaire, Brian Dome, 24-7 national recruiting analyst who has not only covered Virginia recruiting and all the areas in the East, but also deals with Penn State recruiting. So obviously this is a, a big kind of discussion about what Higgins will bring to Penn State. But Brian, Marcus Higgins is a known name around the East, around the Virginia area, around North Carolina. He's really well known as a, a great coach, but also a good person around the recruiting. How much of a loss is this? Yeah, I, I think it's significant. On a couple of levels. I mean, first of all, like you mentioned, he's a good coach. Um, he's a 757 guy who is well liked by kids in recruiting. He knows pretty much everybody in the state. And, you know, you can get into Maryland and DC and down into North Carolina a little bit. He was at UVA for more than a decade just on staff. And, like you mentioned, he, he went through a few coaching changes there. And he was the constant at UVA. And now that constant isn't there, I think it's a really good pickup for Penn State on a number of levels. Obviously, at, at, from the coaching standpoint, they wanted to, you know, they, Penn State had missed on some receivers that they had wanted in the last cycle. And so I think that's why a, a move was made there. And he's a guy that, listen, Penn State is, you know, they've always done well in, in Virginia to DMV stuff like that. And knowing that they're recruiting some kids out of the 757 area and Richmond at receiver, you know, and the guy that jumps out to me because he was at Virginia Tech on, on Tuesday night. So I was talking to him is, is Chance Wiggins. Um, and Marcus Hagens knows him and has known him for a while. And so I, I think it just strengthens Penn State in their ability to recruit in Virginia. And Listen, I'm not going to sit here and say Virginia is doomed because we don't know who they're going to hire. You know, let, let's see who they hire. But it is certainly a big slot that Tony Elliott has to fill on that staff. And and also, Jack, I'll, I'll end this little part with this. You know, I'm just curious on what transpired to, that made Marcus say, OK, after 12 years or whatever it was, it's time to move on. Yeah, there was uh, definitely. Um... It was a shock on Monday morning, but some of the tea leaves were there. You know, obviously his family was affected deeply by by the tragedy. The family was really close with Lavelle Davis, the wide receiver. So there's a lot of that took that kind of goes into a decision like that. But like you like you said too, um, he is such. I know uh, I know a lot of people look at stars when it comes to Coach Hagen's, and when you look at who's he's been able to bring to Virginia, but. At the same time, he recruited well for UVA. I think a lot of people uh, are looking at stars when it comes to who he's able to get. And although he was main recruiter for four-star wide receiver Dakota Tweedy, you forget that he's involved in many other recruitments just to put Virginia on the radar. I mean, Cam Kelly, who is now a transfer, he transferred North Carolina to Virginia. He's a four-star DB. Technically, he was not the primary recruiter for him. Technically, that was Coach Cox and Coach Rudd, the defensive coordinator and the uh, defensive back coach. But you know who was able to establish that connection? It was Coach Higgins because Coach Higgins was the one who first initiated contact during high school when Devin well, Chandler was in the transfer. That was, again, a connection to Coach Higgins. So Coach Higgins' connection has been helping them in the transfer portal. Well, listen, and, and that's why, you know, listen, that, that's the way recruiting is these days. It's not one coach. It's not just a position coach. It's, 
it's somebody who does an area who has connections. And if you're, you know, Virginia, if you're a Virginia prospect or school, and let's be honest, if you are pretty much east of 95 or maybe a little bit west of 95 also, especially on that corridor, there's a good chance Marcus Hagens knows the coach and knows who's coming up early in the ranks because he has those connections. Recruiting isn't just what player did you sign. Recruiting is also knowing who to get on early, you know, having the connections there, setting things up for maybe a different position coach to be involved. It's, it's a general knowledge also. And, finding somebody that has that general knowledge that he has will be challenging for Tony Elliott. Now, listen, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but it's not like Virginia is going all out in the state. So maybe it's not, maybe, maybe that isn't as important as we think it is because it's not like they're going out there recruiting all these in-state kids and battling all these other schools for in-state kids. That's, that's not, you know, if, if you look at it in, in their last class, what did they sign? Six kids from Virginia. Um, yes. And so, oh, yeah. you know, out of, you know, not, not even a third of their classes from within the state. So maybe it's, maybe it's not important. And you know, we're going to talk about uh, Virginia's recruiting strategy and just the overall all, uh, your feelings on the recruiting process in the second half after the break. But when we look at the competition in the trail for Virginia, it's going to be very interesting for them because they have Marcus Higgins and Anthony Poindexter and Penn State and I've heard so many coaches talk about how good Anthony Poindexter is in people's homes and in the coach's office talking to them about their prospect and how good he is at identifying talent early which is so crucial in recruitment and then you have Chip West at Wake Forest His first offer was already a going after Anthony Riddick at Phoebus High School which is a name that UVA fans know because he's visited Virginia in the fall and he was slated to visit Virginia for this junior day. And guess what? After the news of Coach Higgins, it quickly became, I'm visiting junior day to Navy. First of all, with Pondexter at Penn State, listen, the, the way it's going right now, UVA is not beating Penn State for kids, especially from the area. So I, I think that is something that you look at and say, okay, yeah, they're going against Pondexter, who you know, at one point looked like he was going to be the UVA coach instead of Tony Elliott. Um, as far as the others, you're going to get into that in recruiting and, you know, the, the things, especially, you know, you talk about, you know, a, a Chip West and he knows the secrets of UVA and the challenges that UVA, um, you know, what they have and what they're up against. And you're going to get that no matter where you coach, you're, you're going to go, you know, there's so much turnover in college coaching these days that, you're going to wind up going against coaches in recruiting that were at your school or that know your school really well. And to me, that's just all part of the recruiting game. And so UVA just has to, you know, counter it. And I don't know how they count, you know, they'll, they'll come up with some way to make it so it's not a big deal. But what you do know is you, you have the, you have knowledge, like a Chip West has knowledge of both sides of things now. And so he'll be able to talk to kids about that. But, you know, listen, every school negative recruits. I, you know, don't don't sit here and tell me you don't negative. Every school negative recruits. It's just to what degree. And it depends on the kid. Listen, UVA, forget about Pond Extra, Chip West, any other of those. UVA has got to figure out a way to really connect with these kids, especially the in-state kids, to get more of them on campus. That That's what it comes down to. It's not so much as who they're going up against. That You know, worry about what you're doing first before you worry about what others are doing. And I think UVA needs to, um, you know, really figure out what they want to do in recruiting. Is in-state important or is it not important? And that's a good way, a good time to take a break because we're going to be talking about the recruiting strategy and just uh, what we've been hearing from the trail and just what what are kind of our thoughts and not only their 2023 class because uh, Brian we actually didn't bring you on after sign day so your thoughts on there but also our just our first initial impressions on 24 so we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back.
And welcome back to the Good Old Podcast. I'm Jackie Franchilli for Wahoo's 24-7. And we have Brian Doan here, National Recruiting Analyst 24-7 Sports. And we're talking about Virginia football recruiting. We talked about wide receiver coach Mark Higgins going to uh, Penn State. Obviously, that's a huge loss. Marcus Higgins is going to be missed. But they still have work to do on the trail. They still have coaches that are still currently on the road going into several in-state high schools. But before we get to 2024, Brian, the 2023 class, um, I do want to get your, your opinion on how Virginia closed. We we can't really talk about the 23 class without talking about the great work that Virginia did do in securing four-star linebacker Cameron Robinson's signature at the end of the day. Clint Sintum, I think, is the most underrated recruit for Virginia. Not many people talked about his ability on the trail. And I think what Virginia did with Cameron fending off Florida State and fending off South Carolina did end signing day on a good high note. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, and I think if people don't appreciate Clint Symptom, then they, they haven't been paying attention a lot. I know you and I speak about it a lot, you know, off air, just in our conversations and how he's, he was a solid recruiter when Bronco Mendenhall was the coach. He's a good recruiter now. He connects well with the kids. The relationships are big. It's something that you can really tell he enjoys doing. Um, which you can't say about a lot of coaches, not just at UVA, but but across the country. Um, he did a good job. And, and listen, there, there were times where, myself included, thought Cam Robinson was heading to Florida State, um, especially after that visit. Um, it, you know, Florida State did a really good job down the stretch in getting him to visit and making him feel comfortable and, and showing how he could fit in the defense. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, if you look at where Cam plays football, which is in, you know, Essex High and Tappahannock for, you know, which is kind of, let's say isolated, you know, there's a more rural, but um, I think staying close to home, I, I, in speaking with him a lot, uh, he, valued the education. He really felt comfortable with Clint Sintum as his recruiter. Uh, and I think the idea of his family being able to come watch him play a lot was important to him. And so I think, you know, there's a lot that we have questions about with UVA and recruiting, but in this case, they ID'd a kid who they really wanted. Um, they beat out some really good teams. Don't forget at one point, Penn State was heavily involved in this thing too. And UVA found a way to click with Cam Robinson, got his signature. I remember him telling me a few days before signing day that, you know, I said, you know, you sign with UVA. He said, yeah, I'll set with it. And I was like, wow, that, that, that's a big win for them. And he goes, yeah, just, you know, it's where he felt comfortable. Um, and don't underestimate, you know, South Carolina was in there late too. And South Carolina has done an outstanding job recruiting Virginia, Maryland area. And so for them to to win out on that one, that that, that was a big win, and that that's a that's a win that you haven't seen UVA have in in a few years. Forget forget just under Tony Elliott, but with Bronco Mendenhall, I mean they they held off some big time programs in this one. Yeah, I think the last time that I saw them do that was under Mike London when they held off a couple of big programs for both. Quinn Blanding and Andrew Brown, I think, that, and even Taekwon Mazel, that was the last time that I saw Virginia win a battle like that. So that was good to see. And Virginia should expect to win a another big recruit here in the next week or so after they, um, very good job by the staff evaluating. That's a key for Virginia to get in there and evaluate players. They evaluated a three-star safety There's who might be their second highest recruit if he does choose them. Um, so as of Tuesday at 11 in the morning when we're recording this, Brian, uh, Devin Clark has yet to commit. He's uh uh, he's uh, just said he's going to decide this week. So he uh, he's going to plan to announce at some point before National Signing Day. So that's one we're watching. But now that we move to 2024, there's a couple of programs already had their junior day. Virginia had a very good crowd on their first junior, junior day. They had, you know, top 24-7 linebacker Gabriel Williams. They had uh, UVA legacy Zaire Rayner and DJ Tolliver on grounds. They also had... Thomas Dale's Ethan Minter on ground, uh, Mountain View's defensive lineman, Eric Mensa, Edge, Makai Byerson. Um, this upcoming Junior Day has not been, uh, we have not confirmed as many visitors as of yet. Now it's only Tuesday, so this can change. But you have also kept an eye out the Junior Days at, 
at other programs around the area, including obviously in-state rival Virginia Tech and also Penn State. What? How can would you compare how Virginia's Junior Day has been um, from a visitor standpoint, like a visitor list standpoint, but also just like the overall experience and what you've been hearing from kids who possibly have visited both? Oh, boy. Where do we start on this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, it does not have the star power of some other places. I think, I think the easiest thing is to sit there and compare with what Virginia Tech is doing. And Virginia Tech has had, um, you know, they, they have not gone and brought in a bunch of kids. They, they had their first real big night, um, Monday night for the game against Duke, the basketball game. They brought in a lot of recruits for it. They have a big junior day coming up on Saturday. And I, and I you know, putting together that list, it sounds like for the most part, um, you know, some of the in-state kids are heading there. You, ha you have in-state kids um, heading south for some junior days to take a look there. I know like, you know, like Asad Brown is going down to Georgia Tech this weekend. He was at Florida State last weekend. You know, I, I just, I mean, I'm dancing around a little bit, but I guess I should just say it. I, I don't sense the excitement that I want to get when talking to people and kids and coaches about UVA. And they are particular in the way they're recruiting they are not throwing out a ton of offers, which I have no issue with, no issue there. But you, know, you go back to the 23 class, and yeah, they've uncovered some kids, right? You know, you talked about Devin Clark, and you know, sounds like he's going to wind up at UVA. But it's great to uncover some of those kids and get them in your class. If your class is built on that, that's really a hard way to go about things. Um, it can still work. You can out evaluate everybody, but you know, you ask kids to compete on the field where well, you want programs to compete in recruiting. And I don't have an issue, you know, if UVA is on a kid really early and they get him and the kid shuts down his recruitment and he doesn't have a ton of offers, that's great. What, you know, good job by them. Good job evaluating early. But when you're later in a cycle and you're, going the out evaluation route, you know, and that's how you're going to build things. Traditionally, in my experiences of this, that's not the way you want to go about things. That that stuff usually doesn't work out in the long term. Yeah, the the wide the Virginia has been kind of adamant that they do not want to cast a wide net of offers. That's been their model is where they they will only offer the, I guess the first tier of who has committable offers. And then the next round is basically next man up. And then they have like a, a bullpen of like, these are the kids that they would offer if the next man up is not available. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I don't listen. I, if UVA wants to be selective with their offers, I have no problem with that. I, I've been doing this long enough to know that high school coaches will always um, push for their kids to get offer and then say, well, I don't, I don't know why he didn't get offered. And then those high school coaches, some of them wind up coaching in college. And it's like, well, why don't you offer this kid? Well, he's not good enough. Well, yeah. I mean, they're advocating for their kid when they're at the high school level. And their job isn't on the line if UVA takes a kid that maybe can't play at UVA. So I, I never have an issue with if, if, if a school doesn't think a kid is good enough, fine. And they don't want to offer, fine. And a lot of times they'll explain that stuff to the coaches and the coaches will disagree because they're advocating for their kid, you know. Like, listen, I was I was on the phone last week with a coach who was telling me how great his D tackle is, and the kid's five eleven, and he was wondering why a Big Ten school hasn't offered. And I'm like, well, just tell me how many five eleven D tackles are playing in the Big Ten. And so, well, yeah, but he's really good. Well, okay, but you can't ask a coach if they have their principles of a kid needs to be six two or six one or whatever. That's just the way it is. You you can't do anything about it. And, and as far as being selective with offers, that's fine, too. Like, I look at, you know, you look at, like, a Tennessee or a Penn State, and they throw out a ton of offers. Assistant coaches offer kids. I mean, recruiting people in the recruiting office offer kids. That's fine. And then you look at Rutgers, who only offers 
the only offers come from the head coach. If the kid didn't talk to the head coach, he doesn't have an offer. That's just the way they do it. And so it makes it special. And for UVA, if they want to be selective, that's fine. Just make sure these kids understand why it's, you know, why, make sure they understand how selective UVA is. If I'm UVA, I'm making sure they understand that, hey, this offer, not everybody's getting an offer from UVA. They're, they're very regimented in how they do things and, and they don't spread them out. I'm good with that. And if you don't get the first tier of kids that you want to offer, I'm, I'm good with that too, as long as you have your plan set up to where, okay, number one, two, three, four didn't commit. We need to offer five, six, seven, eight. Um, and I have right. no issue with that. That That's fine if that's the way you want to do it. Um, but just make sure you're getting talented kids because there's enough talented kids out there. You just have to find them and work hard at it. Yeah. And just make sure you're communicating with the five, six, seven, eights too. That's yeah, also I mean, listen, I think, I think one make... of the fallacies. Yeah. I think Jack, I think one of the fallacies in recruiting is, you know, so this kid has a top six, you know, whoever, and UVA is not in it. And then UVA offers after that. And people are like, Oh, now you offer, you know, it's not like that's the first time UVA or North Carolina or whom, whatever school has talked to the kid. I mean, as long as you have that relationship building up and saying, hey, we want to get you on campus. We just want to make sure your your size is accurate or make sure you're big enough and, and all that. I have no issue with that. But like I said, just make sure that you are recruiting five, six, seven, eight with the same fervor that you're recruiting one, two, three, four. That's what's important. Yeah, no, and that's that's something that you know they, UVA has done. So Darren Harrison, who was who is currently the second highest recruit in the twenty three class, um, obviously if Devin Clark, Devin Clark could change that if he decides to commit to Virginia. They actually started communicate with them in the spring, got him to visit in the fall, offered him in the fall, got him a new official visit in December, and eventually he signed with Virginia. So there is there is examples that they've done that is just you have to continue those communications. Um, it, it's uh, recruiting is a lot. It, it is a lot. So uh, especially if you are being selective on the offers, uh, you have to just make sure that the five, six, seven, eight understand the process, because I think that's been right. the key. Um, a lot of times is not understanding the process. So as long as you un they understand the process, there's less, uh, I guess, hurt feelings is a is a, is a big thing, um, because that does well, affect long term, too. Yeah. And, and the other thing of this, recruit, you know, some of the stuff that I find absolutely ridiculous is, you know, well, I mean, I, I had a kid tell me the other day in the 24 class that he just got an offer from a school. I said, what do you think? He says, well, they, I'll look at him, but they came in late. Came in late. You, you can't sign for 11 months. And, you know, and I don't, I don't blame the kids because they're getting it from their inner circle. And right. listen, it doesn't matter when you get an offer. If that's the school you want to go to, you know, don't have hurt feelings. Think about what your future is. If that's the right fit for you, that's what matters. And so I, I just look at it as, you know, it's not just communicating with the kid what's going on. It's communicating with the parent or the coach mm -hmm. or the trainer, or whomever you're dealing with to make Whoever's sure. Whoever's in that inner circle, that's eventually yeah. going to help them make a decision. And, and to me, that's the important aspect of it. And listen, it's a, it's a learning curve for Tony Elliott, A, being a head coach for the first time, and B, coming from Clemson. I mean, at Clemson, you could offer a kid on – you know, for this last class, you could offer a kid December 18th and sign him on the 21st because you're Clemson. And it could be a highly rated kid. It don't work that way at UVA. No, that is that is true. That is uh, definitely a learning curve for someone who come the, uh, you know, Clemson. I still remember going head to head with Florida on a couple of recruits and they would come in with an offer and Florida would have to fight tooth and nail. And a lot of times they lost against the Tigers. So it is definitely a different beast when you're recruiting for Clemson than you are when you're recruiting for uh, UVA. And um, before we kind of let you go, Brian, when you look at this 2024 class, I know it's way too early to talk about if someone's close to committing. I think several of the prospects are still taking their junior day visits. A lot of prospects are yeah. having time to visit. A lot of them had their seasons during the fall, so they were able to get some some visits in there. When you look at some of these guys that have been on campus already, or on grounds already, 
who do you feel um, Virginia is in a good spot early on? You know, obviously, Makai Byerson is the one that stands out to me. Um, Zaya Rayner is another. Who do you feel is Virginia is in a good position right now? Yeah, I, I think I think when you look at a guy like Byerson, he, he likes UVA a lot. He's been there multiple times. He connects well with the coaching staff. He likes the usage in the defense. Academics are important to him. Listen, I'm, I'm not naive, man. I'll let you know when a kid makes a decision that's academic first over football. Um, when I find one of those kids, I'll let you know. Um, and I don't just mean now, I mean in, in life. I mean, I, I once had a kid commit to Rutgers over Harvard. Um, so, you know, it's it's always about fit in football and everything. Um, I think Byerson is a kid. I think Eric Mentz is a kid. Um, Obviously, Zaire Rayner with with UVA offering is a is a kid worth keeping an eye on. Zaire Rayner was supposed to be at Tech on Monday night. Um, something fell through with his plans; he couldn't make it there. But I think if you're UVA and you're looking at this thing, um, you got your kids on campus on you know in in January. You got you know some of them. February is kind of a take a look at things for the kids and for the schools and figure out what you want to do and getting kids back on campus in March. Um, I think there's a long way to go. You look at a guy like Makai Byerson, who may be not as well known across the region or, you know, maybe into the Midwest as some others may think, you know, or, or I, I should say not as well known as some others, but you think that if other schools really start going back and doing their homework on him. He's a kid that could really see his offer list grow. So I think with UVA, you just have to continue to be diligent and understand. I think the biggest thing for UVA is understand who you are, the type of kid that you can get to UVA and recruit there. And then, you know, make sure that Tony Elliott is front and center and working to build these relationships really strong because I think at the end of the day, what I'm seeing more and more is the relationships with the head coaches are becoming bigger and bigger factors because kids and families are starting to figure out that position coaches lead more of a nomadic lifestyle. And so for me, I think we're looking at some in-state kids right now but it's only because maybe some of the out-of-state kids haven't been able to get to campus as much. Yeah, a lot of the uh, out-of-state kids generally um, tend to look more towards official visits in a lot of cases because that's the best time for them, and especially in the summer. That's usually when we see them or during spring break. Spring break is a, is a big time for visits, so obviously that's a time for us to uh, kind of look there. But Brian, in-state in Virginia from 24 and 25 has got a, a good, decent amount of good nationally ranked kids. So. Um, it's a, it's yeah, a class I mean, to kind of go in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd like to see, you know, you know. I, I look at like Kalen Adams, Chris Jones, Fletcher Westfall, Kashawn Henderson, DJ Tolliver, Saad Brown, Chance Wiggins, Kai White. I mean, you know, you you'd like to see those kids get to campus in in March, get to campus for a spring practice. I think that's the stuff that's important. Yeah, just um, uh, like even if they don't sign, it's just creating buzz around the program. Well, Getting, and, and you know what? Why, that, why that, Chris Jones is visiting? Let me go visit too. Well, yeah, and people are going to pay attention when Chris Jones visits. Um, you know, I, I look at stuff like that. I look at, you know, I, I think, and this isn't stuff that UVA fans want to hear, but I think one of the things what you look at with Virginia Tech is they've done such a good job of getting the top players from 24 on campus. They, they've done a, you know, whether it was in the fall, whether it was in December, whether it was this month, they've done a really good job of getting kids and went on campus. And when I, when I speak to coaches and trainers throughout the state, um, you know, you, it, it's kind of turned a little bit, right? When it first started, it was, Everybody, when Tony Elliott and Brent Pry were hired, you know, Brent Pry, the Virginia Tech coach, it was a lot about Tony Elliott and his message and how coaches were listening. And there was a lot of stuff like that. Um, 
And now it seems like the momentum in state, when you're talking about tech first UVA, I feel like the momentum is on tech side right now. And you can flip it. You, you just have to work at it, and, but you can flip it. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a, a recruiting is never stagnant. You can always change where, uh, where things are trending, especially this early in the process. This is a, this is Tony Elliott and his staff's first opportunity to really recruit ahead. Last year, they couldn't recruit the future class because they were busy getting all those O-lines signed. This is their first opportunity to get ahead. And that's what they've been doing. Tony Elliott um, has been on the road going to most of these high schools in state and to some other high schools in the area so they can get ahead in 24s and 25s. So uh, that's been their kind of focus on. But Brian, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Hey, always, Jackie, you know that. And listen, folks for listening, and I don't say this about anybody, you will not find a better person covering UVA than Jackie. So, uh, you know, the more support you give her, the better. And I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> no, she doesn't have enough money to pay me to say that, but it's true. <laughs> no, I do have two kids. So yeah, that's very, very true. <laughs> well, Brian, thanks. All right. Thanks, Jackie. And thank you so much for Brian Doan for coming on the show. It's nice to have someone who's not just connected to the UVA program, just to kind of get us overall feel of what's going on, especially because Brian Doan is very heavily connected to several programs in the East. And like he kind of talked about, he covers a lot of different junior days like Virginia Tech's, Penn State's, North Carolina's, NC State's, um, Maryland's, uh, Ohio State. He, he really helps out the region and uh, to kind of follow up with kids on their experiences in those junior days and visits. And that helps us compare with what Virginia is doing, especially because a lot of times when you're looking at North Carolina, Virginia Tech, especially uh, Wake Forest and, and Penn State, that they're kind of recruiting the same kids. Um, as we saw Chip West offering Anthony Riddick on Tuesday, and that, was a, that is a prospect that Virginia is also interested in evaluating. So there's going to be a lot of head-to-head -head battles. So thanks again for Brian for joining us on the show. And of course, if you are interested in continuing to follow us, go ahead and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you can, why don't you go and rate and review us on Apple and Spotify and go ahead also and like this page on YouTube, like this channel like this video, and also ring the bell so that you're notified whenever there's a new video. So again, thank you so much for joining us. We will be back on Thursday for our basketball episode. Obviously, Virginia basketball is taking a little bit of a rest this week. They're not having a game until Saturday, which is happens to be also the junior day because they were, they're connecting both of them together with uh, Virginia's home game. So we will have that on Thursday. We'll also tease a little bit about the junior day, but more, more of our episode on Thursday will be focused on the Virginia basketball programs. So I hope you guys have a good rest to your Tuesday, and I will be right back here on Thursday.